we release new production versions of Canva every weekday on every device and in every language. Neuroadaptive machine translation has actually been critical, I think, to our success. More than 80% said that remote simultaneous interpreting is more difficult than on-site interpreting. Doing what the European Union does best, which is regulating things. Welcome to Slater Pod 69. Hello from the beautiful town of Zurich. Hello from the not so beautiful, I mean, it's a very beautiful city of London. Of London, capital of Europe, still <laughs> is. Brexit or no, no Brexit, you know, biggest city. Debatable, but sure. Well, who's, who else is in the running? Uh, I don't know, Amsterdam? Paris? Amsterdam would be like, would be, Amsterdam would be like a suburb of London, size-wise. So, no. No. There we go. False modesty on the part of the English person. Absolutely. Well, today, no false modesty. One of the most exciting podcasts, and I can tell you that because we already recorded it, uh, because <laughs> it's it was early in the morning for us, late afternoon in Sydney, where we spoke to Rachel Carruthers, Head of Internationalization Localization at Canva, and Michael Livo, Localization Program Lead at Canva. Canva being the super easy, super easy to use and powerful graphic design tool, which I use all the time and love. Mm. And it's, yeah, it's, it's actually one of my favorites as technology. We have like seven seats as a company on it. So, you know, half of our team has a, has a Canva seat. It's a, it's a great tool. So it's Sydney based April, uh, in April 2021, they raised another 70 million at a $15 billion valuation. So, Probably the most, um, I guess, successful startup so far in Australia. Uh, founded by uh, Melanie Perkins, who's only 34 years old. So, yeah, I have done something like that. <laughs> Making me feel very the inadequate. There by we the go. time when <laughs> I was 34 years old. Um, and yeah, the original idea, and uh, Rich is going to talk a bit more about that, but was from like um, from something they called Fusion Books, allowed students mm. to design their own school year books. And, you know, like uh, Rachel is going to talk about it. They have a huge uh, localization operation, um, including, you know, the internationalization components, a very complex and, and large team, fast growing, hiring everywhere. They posted a few jobs and lock jobs and, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic company. So on the agenda today, briefly, we're going to talk about a new survey that's out on RSI. Uh, then Straker published results uh, also down in, in New Zealand, further up north in, in Australia, AI media. So we're staying in with the Australia theme here. Then the European Union is, is laying out some proposed guidelines on how to handle AI and uh, Google Translate's anniversary. But first, why do 80%, 83% of interpreters think remote simultaneous interpreting is quote unquote more difficult, Esther? Why is that? Ooh, why? You're delving straight into the why. Well, I'm, I'm not too sure. We can maybe dig into that a little bit. But this, uh, the headline that you just quoted was the result of a survey that came out of uh, Paris-based École Supérieure d'Interprète et de Traducteur, otherwise known as ESIT. I believe. Um, so this survey was looking to quantitatively understand the experiences of conference interpreters with RSI, remote simultaneous interpreting. And obviously this is extremely topical, um, having seen a very large boost in um, RSI during the pandemic. Um, well, so the survey, uh, I think, had something like 850 plus responses. Mm. So it's pretty sizable. Um, and they were respondents from both staff and freelance universe working in the private market as well as international organizations the eu and public administration so quite a good cross-section of um, the interpreter landscape i guess um, there was i suppose just to pull out some stats a, a, an unsurprisingly huge shift from on-site uh, interpreting pre-covid uh, so something like 98%, I think, if you add it up, of people surveyed said they either only worked on site pre-pandemic or mostly worked on site pre-pandemic, 98%. Um, wow. And then flipping forward to the COVID or post-COVID era, um, that dramatically shifted. And I think it was remote, well, it was definitely remote interpreting that came out as the dominant mode 
um, with 33% saying that they only did remote interpreting post-COVID and 49, so nearly half of all respondents saying that they mostly did remote interpreting during, well, after COVID, during COVID, whatever. Um, so yeah, unsurprising, but I mean, I, I guess I was sort of maybe more surprised by the numbers pre-pandemic that is so high because um, I... But yeah, it's interesting to see how how that's how that has swung the needle. But then obviously there is still some room, uh, on-site and in-person interpreting going on still. Um, so they also looked at yeah. the tools used, right? There yeah. was some interesting data around that. That was that was really fascinating. I mean, I yeah, that just to give the headlines around that, the question really that elicited the response was, which platform have you used? for more than 50% of your RSI assignments. So which one do you work with most of the time? Um, and I think nearly three quarters of the respondents said Zoom interpretation. Um, and if you look at that, if you look at the responses on the pie chart, as we have done in, in the article, it's, I mean, it's over, it's overwhelming, sort of the dominance of Zoom there. Mm. And some of the other platforms mentioned were the ones that we we know about. So Interprefy um, said 7%. Um, For more than numbers. 50% of your RSI. So 7%. Exactly. So let's say, I don't know, I'm doing the math here, but probably 60 people have used Interprefy for more than 50%. So they're basically exactly. like Interprefy interpreters, for example. Yeah. yeah. So more than yeah, more than 50% of the assignments that these people do are done using Interprefy. That's seven seven percent. So it's sort of similar numbers at this level. So Kudo, I think that says five, and Interactio, which was the one selected by the EU yeah. recently, I believe, is around the same, about six percent. And then there, a lot of other platforms mentioned as well, um, but obviously used to to a somewhat lesser degree. Any other major insights there in terms of working conditions? No. Working um, conditions, well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, unsurprisingly, again, it's been quite a challenging shift. I mean, if you think that I think most of the people in this survey had worked as interpreters or have worked as interpreters for more than 15 years. So this shift to suddenly doing everything or most things remote is, is difficult to, to stomach, um, difficult to adapt to. So they said in the survey, two thirds of the respondents think that Working conditions for RSI are worse than with on-site interpreting. Half of the respondents said that they think they perform worse with RSI. But again, this could be a learning a learning curve. Um, and more than 80%, as we said in the headline of the article, is more than 80% said that remote simultaneous interpreting is more difficult than on-site interpreting. So I think definitely a big shift and probably a huge kind of learning um well yeah learning that needs to take place it is is <clears throat> yeah i i wonder what i'd like to know more we should we should mm. get an interpreter on, on the pod and just understand mm. more what the real difficulty is in doing this i mean there's the whole visual cues and the setting and probably the pace with which you're being invited but yeah i don't want to speculate here i i do mm understand that it's taxing mentally and like also yeah. just to, it's to, like to, anything to, when you're a, a, yeah. when you're adopting a new tool i mean it's it's sort of probably akin to translators having to shift to work either with machine translation or with cat tools back in the day it's a massive change in your process and, and your mental yeah men, mental activity i just i also wonder if the clients like don't really think of you anymore like when you they don't see you there I, I don't know the, let's not mm. speculate the purpose listening to this they're like hey man i don't know just ask me. you don't know, you don't know what <laughs> you you're talking no about <laughs> so uh we just mentioned interpretify actually when i uh pulled up our hop in events tool this morning mm. uh, i stumbled across um interpretify they're now a an official uh add-on to hop in to oh, the wow. to the platform, so you can now mm. dial them in. It was it was there's actually a little video uh, there how how to plug Interprefy in, uh, mm -hmm. and like you need to give them a heads up, and then they you know have the interpreter ready for you. But it's 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 very much plugged into Hopin. So congrats to Interprefy to being I think so far the only interpreting add-on to Hopin, which is the most well-funded remote conferencing platform um, that yeah. that's out there. And you know I, I see that they're well-funded now. They're adding a ton of features for us. So. 
looking mm-hmm. forward to our Slater Con remote in, uh, in, when is it? In two weeks. In two weeks on Ascension Day. Um, yeah, Ascension Day. We did not notice this. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you, sorry, you weren't plugged, in, plugged into the uh, bank holiday calendars. No. I mean, this is actually a big-ish one here because people take, yeah. uh, they take, I mean, Thursday is off. So you take Friday off and Friday you do a long as well, weekend. Yeah. Yeah, you do so the bridge, as, yeah, you do as we used to say. Bridge, uh, we did not uh, cons- consider that. Nonetheless, lots of people are registering. Fantastic speakers. We just uh, confirmed Marianne Henselman, the Senior Translation Program Director of ADP, a giant, I, I don't know, I'm probably butchering this, but like a payroll HR software okay. company. And nice. uh, yeah, she's going to talk about their journey uh, from kind of an in- startup within the company, the log team, to now really being under the CTO office and being kind of a core part of the uh, of the operations there. So that that's going to be great. Moving on to Australia, Straker Q4 results very briefly. Um, slightly above expectation, I'd say, given the share price jumped uh, 13%, but it's quite a uh, thinly traded stock. So there's a lot of volatility in that stock. Anyways, investors... Seem to be pleased so far. Oh, um, in terms of the the revenues, at just above twenty two million dollars. I do I do think though that's Aussie dollars. So let's just stick with the Aussie dollars here. So that's uh, thirty one million Aussie dollars. I think and it's then, New Zealand. You think it's no. New Zealand? Well. <laughs> I think because they're listed in Australia, they might they might they might report in Aussie dollars. Anyway, sorry, uh, and let's stick to. I think it's Aussie dollars, but we... I'll check. You carry on. Yeah. Anyway, so 41 million whatever dollars. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll research this and bring it to you. Uh, so sizable, um, uh, sizable SV. So $30 million would be if you included Proforma Lingotech, uh, which they acquired uh, a few months ago for the full year. So Straker getting really from this um, kind of breaching into a new size into really firmly the <clears throat> our, our leader segment. Right mm. from from the ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar challenger into the the leader segment, which obviously brings uh, brings challenges, but also bigger opportunities with big accounts. And speaking of big accounts, they they did win this huge IBM deal, which also propelled the stock up. And uh, and now they're working uh, they're working through it, and it looks like they're they're very busy onboarding all these. I think it's like dozens and dozens of languages at IBM. So good for them. In terms of the bottom line, it's always hard to read. I'm not going to try here, but it looks like they're somewhere around break even, slightly positive because they don't report on an EBITDA basis. They report on like operating and total cash flows. Mm-hmm. Um, we would have to look into this a little more closely, but. So they talked a bit about the the Lingotech acquisition. Lingotech had this uh, kind of TMS component and also a fair amount of services. Uh, so they they Straker at the time said they were acquiring them as as a content on ramp, and, and and that's what they're doing now. They're integrating Lingotech. They're integrating a lot of the connectors that Lingotech has into the yeah. Ray system, which is the more automated kind of translation workflow uh, system that that Straker has. That's Straker's proprietary solution. So they're merging the two. Uh, and they're also talking about subscription translation services. So like building really this kind of integrated, um, you know, SaaS like platform that they're going to go out there and, uh, and, and win some new clients. And apparently they want Panasonic in, in the most recent quarter. So good for them. Yeah. And it uh, is New ter- Zealand dollars. <laughs> it's New Zealand dollars. All right. Thank you so yeah. much. So let's just go through. So it's 22 million US dollars just for mm. our global audience uh, in, in actual revenue in the full year, financial year 2021. And if you added Lingotech now, they'd be at, a, at an annual run rate of like 30 million US dollars. So mm-hmm. sizable. Yeah. And these are unaudited still. I think they're going to release the full year results in May, probably. Won't be that different, likely. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I hope they're not going to be too different. Hey, our auditor found $10 million <laughs> uh, additional revenue somewhere. Or oh, that's day. nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably the opposite. Uh, so uh, also Australia, AI Media, the yeah. captioning uh, firm, captioning excess services. So they bought a uh, captioning subtitle technology firm called EEG. I uh, never heard of them personally, but uh, what, what's going on there, Esther? Yeah, I think EEG was quite sizable in their own 
right. They were forecasting around um, 9 million US dollars uh, for 2021. Um, but as you said, AI Media is, again, Australia-based um, and EEG is a US-based tech company operating in that same space. So this is AI Media's, I think, fourth acquisition of a US-based company in less than a year Mm. and it's also their third acquisition since they went well since they did their IPO in September of last year Um, EEG is the largest of the acquisitions that they've they've done so far Um, and in order to finance the acquisition AI Media has or is in the process of doing a placement and entitlement offer so to raise equity from the markets um, by and they're going to do that by the end of May. Um, the so beauty of being listed, access to capital. Access to capital. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we can't talk about their shares because it doesn't seem to have, uh, well, I don't think there's any new information on the shares since early this week, maybe. Really? Let me check our stopped. real-time chart of listed yeah. MSP service. N- nothing there? It was, so what, uh, there they was stopped trading or? on Yahoo Finance. I don't know whether this the placement sort of has some kind of impact on whether, yeah. whether they Stop. trade. Yeah. But anyway, they're going to pay eventually uh, $34 million for EEG. Uh, three times revenue. There you go. Three, SAS. Yeah. Three, a bit more than three if it's nine. Yeah. Three and a bit times revenue. Um, and that will be done by an initial cash payment of $20 million US dollars, $10 million in AI media shares, and then an earn out as well on top of that. And then together, they will be forecasting something in the region of um, 44 million US dollars, I think. So the AI media forecast excluding EEG is around 35 million US dollars in revenues to June. And they're going to make money, finally. So they're going to become EBITDA positive with this acquisition because they used to lose money, um, negative uh, uh, profitability. And now with this acquisition, they're going to enter the profit zone. So good for them. Moving to the European Union, doing what the European Union does best, which is regulating things. (laughs) Now they want to regulate intelligence. Artificial Mm. one at that. Tell us more. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting story. I found myself kind of going down the rabbit hole of of wondering how do you even begin to regulate this? And especially when it's such a fast moving space that the moment you've documented regulation around current technologies and current systems, it will already have moved on. Um, but despite those challenges, the, uh, I think everybody, or at least the EU and a lot of people are sort of thinking that regulation is is a priority around AI and AI systems. Uh, but this proposal set out uh, some, some guidelines, the sort of proposals for how um, AI should be regulated. And I think for the most part, it focuses on these high risk settings. So identifying areas of AI and AI use cases, A, where, I mean, AI should not be used at all. So they were saying using AI will be banned in certain scenarios like subliminal techniques to manipulate people's behavior in harmful ways i mean that seems like an obvious uh, scenario where you would not want to or for which you would not want to use ai it's pretty broad yeah i guess maybe intentionally so to me that sounds like youtube algorithms like you start clicking on something slightly violent and then like three videos later you're in some crazy uh you know uh, yeah other video yeah so they were more specific as well so they've said general police of so it would not be allowed in general police use of real time remote biometric identification systems in public areas so they are being quite specific as well and then the social credit system so social credit yeah. social credit and, and real time biometric identification that's just what mm. china does right so basically yeah no it's true i mean you look at you know, the, the AI looks at uh, like a, yeah. a busy place or an intersection or a subway station and then it just, you know, facial recognition. They know who you are, what you do. Yeah. Uh, and match whatever you do to your social credit score. So, hey, he's walking into the casino. Well, there's no casinos in China. But <laughs> if you do, you get this, you know, they take, yeah. they take a Minus credit away. Points. Minus, Minus points. Minus points for gambling. Yeah. What's Florian doing at 1 a.m. in the morning with a <laughs> slightly shaky... We do not want to know. <laughs> 
Um, good. So how does that, how does that right. connect yes. to what we talk about? What we honestly, care about, but, right. Yeah. Well, um, it doesn't say anything specifically about machine translation, but it does classify things like chatbots and NLP products as low risk. So these are kind of low risk scenarios, which means that they probably would have a lesser, uh, lesser regulation, less stringent regulation. So for example, they probably would not have to, uh, I think there was something like registering on registering on an, an index or database indexed in, a, in an EU wide database, that sort of thing probably wouldn't apply to the lower risk scenarios. Um, but they, or companies might have to inform their users or their buyers when they're interacting with a machine. So the way that I would interpret that is having some kind of disclaimer, to, which we've seen, for example, in machine translated documentation in the past to say this document has been prepared using machine translation. Please refer to the original if there's any discrepancies or something along those lines. Um, but I mean, it, it doesn't mention machine translation specifically, and I think it does raise a few questions. Such as? Such as, I'm glad you asked. Well, I mean, if you have to disclose when machine translation has been used, um, always, and I think a lot of LSPs are in the practice of, of doing that anyway with, with their customers, but do you still have to disclose the fact that a machine translation has been used if you've also used a human reviewer or a human post editor or you know, the interactive workflows. I would think not because uh, no, I mean, at that, that would... point it's sort of inconsequential. Yeah. Um, but then equally, how would that governance or how would the guidelines change as machine translation is, is getting better? Would it still be necessary? Uh, so it's these, these kind of questions uh, coupled with the fact that, as I said, it's a really fast moving space. How do you, strike the balance between protecting users and protecting the general public from potential misuse of AI, but also not stifling innovation and keeping pace with what is actually happening on the ground. I think the reason why they didn't in include machine translation is that it's just too far down the application pyramid, mm. maybe. And it does, it's not like a cool... It's not visionary enough. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, uh, and it's also, it's less, it's kind of not a philosophical question yet, but I mean, mm. they can't even begin to regulate this. This seems like really a stretch. And I mean, mm. I, okay, I get the social credit, the subliminal technique and like the biometric identification system. Like those are, yeah. you know, yeah, um, regulate. Who knows if you really need to regulate, but you just don't want to, you don't want to enable people. I mean, like, like. Biometric identification system just means like, well, if you don't put up any cameras, you can't begin to uh, track, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Long story short, I think they they want to be very careful with this. If they if they go too far in the European Union, I mean, all these companies are, I mean, they're just going to be like in the blink of an eye, they're going to be with... somewhere else, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's not. I like... think they have to start somewhere though, because there is there are a lot of calls for this to be monitored and legislated. Yeah. Okay. I'm on the side of monitored, I guess, but don't legislate too much. I mean, mm. because you're, you're, yeah. you'll end up by the time they've legislated, this has moved on. And, yeah. And then, yeah. Well, I think if they keep it pretty general and high level, then that maybe would not be the case. If you avoid being too specific, then you, there's still room for interpretation and room for development of the tech, which I think yeah. maybe seems like the way they're going, but let's see. So one of the most successful MT applications, obviously, is Google Translate. And just to close on this, they got a 1 billion installs now, not downloads, but installs of the app, mm -hmm. Google Translate. They just celebrated this under a blog. So uh, that's that's a lot of installs of Google Translate on, uh, you know, probably 20% iPhone, 80% Android. Um, that was not, though, that stat is just for Android. Is that just for Android? Yeah. I checked right. the piece and it said it was referencing Google Play, uh, is that what it's called on the... Yeah, Google Play. Yeah, Yeah. so that was just on the stats from Google Play. They haven't got any stats from the Apple Store. And that's maybe like 250 million more on, on iPhone. So that's <laughs> that's a lot of uh, Google Translates out there. So they yeah. started this uh, in 2010, January. So just a year or so after the iPhone came out, um, if I remember correctly. 
And then by January 2014, four years later, it had 100 million do- uh, million dollars, 100 million uh, <laughs> installs. Uh, then a year later, 300 million. Then in 2015 or 2016, they rolled out the NMT. Uh, they also made it available offline, uh, so you, you you didn't actually need an internet connection to use it. And uh, 750 million was in June 2019, and now already a billion. So let's let's see where where this is going. But it's a uh, Super popular. We spoke many times around traffic to um, or the, the numbers of words processed by by DeepL estimate or, or or Google Translate. I think for Google Translate, we came up with something like two to four hundred billion words a day. A lot of this would be also kind of automated uh, things you wouldn't see, like uh, you know just just uh, translating all Chrome pages automatically, etc. But uh, it's it's a lot of translation that's going through through Google Translate, obviously via the app, via the browser. And uh, you know, congrats to them for installing it on a billion phones. That's uh, quite quite an achievement. Yeah. And let's see if Canva is also installed on a billion phones. It's installed on my phone, uh, definitely. I, lo- I love the app too, not just the browser based. So uh, the app is uh, is very handy when you want to tweak an image super quickly. So let's. I haven't to, tried uh, the app. Maybe yeah. that maybe that can be my my takeaway. That I'm going to try the app. Try the app. Canva. It's great. Yeah. It's uh, as easy to use as the the browser based version of Canva. So. Cool. Let's talk to Rachel and Michael. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, I'm super excited to speak to the two people who bring my very favorite SaaS tool, Canva, to global users. So hi, Michael. Hi, uh, Rachel. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Esther. Hi, welcome Great to the to podcast. So thanks for having us. Of course. Thanks so much for, for joining us uh, from, uh, from Australia nonetheless, uh, on the other side of the world. So Rachel, you're the head of internationalization localization at Canva and Michael, you're the localization program lead. Um, Rachel, you'll tell us a bit more about Canva, of course, but uh, it's my favorite SaaS tool. I've got to be honest. It's uh, it, I've used it now for, <laughs> I don't know, probably four years and it keeps getting better and makes my life easier. And I spend too much time on it, to be honest. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm handing over, I'm trying to hand over, but it's, it's so easy and so, so good, good easy to use. So, so Rachel, yeah. why don't you tell us a bit more about Canva, uh, what it is, when it was founded, sure. etc. cetera. Yeah. So, um, Canva is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, a, uh, a simple way to create beautiful graphics, basically it's a, it's a drag and drop design tool, um, and, and publishing tool actually as well. Um, that's made to be really user friendly, um, for people like me who can't design anything. Uh, and it was kind of born of the idea, actually, Mel, our CEO, um, in her, I think, college day, she uh, was teaching design, graphic design to students, um, and uh, they were learning tools like, you know, Adobe, Photoshop, and Illustrator, and um, just found that these tools are you know, really cumbersome. They're obviously quite powerful and amazing tools, but they're very cumbersome. They could be hard to learn, um, and they're also quite expensive um, for, you know, folks like students who don't have a lot of money and just, just kind of thinking, you know, this, there's got to be a better way, um, and Thus, Canva was born. Um, I believe the product launched uh, in 2013, um, so a little while ago. And it's just, um, yeah, it's really been on uh, quite the the whirlwind um, international growth journey, uh, which Michael and I are, are lucky to be a part of um, uh, with the localization team and, and broader kind of global services team as well. Um, and I guess this is a quick intro to what to what we do um, within kind of the global services and, and localization spaces. Uh, really to grow Canva's um, adoption and awareness internationally. So looking over that larger globalization scope um, from product localization uh, and working with different uh, stakeholders and teams around the business, uh, like marketing, um, product leads, um, and such to make sure that um, every every Canva user has an experience that feels truly local. Yeah, we want to definitely dig more into that. So Rachel, Michael, just tell us a bit more about your personal professional background, like uh uh, you were with uh, on the vendor side before, uh, so just tell us a bit more about your personal background, professional background. How did you? Uh, when did you join Canva as well? Yeah, um, well, for me, uh, I was I was working. I'm from uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area, and I was working um, in localization uh, with SaaS companies. I was working with Delocalize on on the vendor side, and then uh, I actually came in over to Australia in 2015 to pursue my master's degree uh, in media practice studies. Um, and I was going to try to 
Biden on my skill sets and and leave vocalization behind. And uh, lo and behold, that's not exactly how things worked out. Um, uh, yeah, and so you know, really was able to uh, was fortunate enough to to um, join the Canva team in 2017 um, when we were looking. I think Canva was in about 20 languages at the time, and uh, the goal, the first goal, was to get uh, I guess Mel's exact words were uh, get Canva into as many languages as Microsoft Word, which turned out to be I think, just over a hundred. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was really, um, <laughs> yeah, the first focus for us. And um, the program is really, really born out of that mission. What about you, Michael? Yeah, and uh, well, b before localization in, in 2015, I wasn't yet working in localization. I, was, uh, I started my language career teaching linguistics at the University of New South Wales. Um, which actually turned out to be really great preparation for working at Canva with those over a hundred languages because uh, we did a, we got a lot of exposure to linguistic typologies, or how languages differ from one another, um, and that was really great because it sharpens your instincts of all the things that can go wrong when you're localizing into 132 <laughs> languages. I think at our at our peak, um, and then soon after that, I moved to Appen, which is a LSP that was. Uh, founded and is still based uh, here in Sydney. Uh, for those who don't know Appen, they um, they uh, provide training data for AI and machine learning applications, including machine translation. Um, and that was really my first entry to the, the world of businesses and, and technology. And it was a really fun time. And I learned a, a huge amount from uh, a small group of really brilliant people who are still there at Appen, still doing amazing work. Um, uh, and I was there a few years, interrupted by a, a short stint at uh, grad school in New York. And uh, I started in the technical role as a linguist and then drifted towards more business development and engineering roles, uh, which is probably why Rach thought I would be a good fit for Canva. And thank God that she did. Uh, and I've been lucky enough to have amazing colleagues again here uh, and a whole new universe of things to understand and work with. So, yeah. It's been a, a great journey to, to this point. So, so thanks so much, Michael. So you're you're at the team space. Most of the team, the lock team also is based in Sydney. Is, is that correct? Or is it globally distributed? We are globally distributed. We have um, six people here in Sydney uh, and four more people over in Manila, or I think I've got that the wrong way around. We have four people here in Sydney and six people over in Manila. For a little while, we had someone in uh, London until they were able to move over here. They were stuck over there for a little while during COVID. Um, and we will have a person in San Francisco in the near future. So we're globally distributed and rapidly becoming more globally distributed. Oh, and I should say we, we have language managers now who have, we've hired over the last two months who are uh, you know, around 16 countries around the world. So I would say our distribution is now complete. We are fully distributed. Very yeah, I good. Think we, <laughs> we, we advertised a couple of those jobs on lock jobs. So, uh, that's uh, right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we found amazing people. So we're really happy. We've got sure. an amazing team now. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, what, um, maybe tell us a bit more about the roles that you do have around uh, various uh, parts of the world. Uh, so you mentioned language managers, and obviously we're meeting you two today, but uh, what other roles do you have? What's the structure and setup um, internally? Yeah, I, I might take this one, Rach. Um, our structure has yeah. oscillated over time. Um, we've kind of fluctuated between being a, a team, which works really closely together, and being a more loosely connected network of people embedded throughout the company. Um, and we've more or less settled on a blended approach now where we, we have core teams and then people who are, who are off working primarily with other teams. Um, but within that, those core teams, we have uh, a traditional localization team with project managers who facilitate localization of the product and marketing and, and our content, which is our graphic design templates. Um, uh, and those project managers are all over the company. They're, they'll be working in our support team or they'll be working in our content creation teams or they'll be working in our uh, any one of our product teams, our print and partnerships team, for instance. Um, and then we have a localization engineering team, um, mm -hmm. which is led by my colleague, Ben Lloyd, who uh, the aforementioned person previously stuck in London. Um, and that team ensures that the uh, 
engineers at Canva, all the other engineers at Canva have all the infrastructure they need to uh, efficiently launch every new Canva feature in every uh, language we have at Canva, which is a huge task. Uh, yeah. And we're hiring for that team right now. So if you're a back-end or full-stack engineer and listening to the podcast, uh, <laughs> come and find me. Can't, can't resist a plug. Um, and uh, the third kind of group of people is the uh, language managers that I mentioned. That's um, headed by our uh, LQA expert, Raymond. Uh, and those people are in charge of testing and benchmarking and uh, experimentation with our localized products. Um, and as I said, we now have 16 native speaker language managers who have onboarded over the last three months, which was a mam mammoth effort. Uh, and yeah, we're really happy with the people we've got. We've got such amazing people working in that team and they're already having such a huge impact for us. Um, just giving so much insight mm -hmm. and expertise on their, their own native languages that you just can't do without having those people in your company uh, with that experience and expertise. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and it sounds like you've got quite broad reach as well across the organization. If you've mentioned people being located in, in different teams and then having the central hub, I mean, where does the localization and internationalization operations or functions sit within broader Canva organization? Yeah, I could probably um, speak to that one, actually. So um, our kind of technical home uh, is within the uh, marketing and engagement kind of super group that we have. So um, kind of fitting in more along the marketing side of things. Um, but when we talk about engagement, there's a lot of product groups on this side of the company as well, doing things like um, kind of experimentation frameworks about how to you know drive engagement within the product. Obviously, localization um, and global growth um, is a huge part of that. Um, so that's where we we kind of on an org chart sit. Um, but as Michael mentioned, uh, we have kind of this embedded uh, sort of model. I kind of like to think of it as like a little well, it's hub and spoke. That's the normal term, but I think of it as like an octopus for some strange reason, <laughs> where we have that kind of technical home. Um, and then our localization project managers are, yes, embedded um, to different areas of the business. So different groups like our content and discovery group, uh, who are responsible for producing the content that is can that is in Canva, like the uh, the templates, um, the fonts um, that are needed to design in all different languages, um, design elements uh, that are local and bespoke as well. Um, getting into different product areas like search and discoverability. So it's all wonderful to have this beautiful localized content in Canva, but if users aren't intuitively finding it and it's not discoverable through a well-localized search, um, that's no good. So we have our colleague Paul sitting across all of that. Um, a few of our colleagues in Manila are more on that marketing side of things. So again, embedded and, and properly sitting with um, you know, our email and messaging teams, um, our uh, performance marketing teams to make sure that they're, that they have kind of the best in practice localization workflows at their fingertips to make sure that, you know, what they need gets done and gets done properly because as I'm sure probably a lot of the listeners of this podcast are aware, you know, localization isn't always a one size fits all thing, right? You know, the way that you're going to need to approach it, the workflows, the tools might look different depending on what you're working on. So that's really the point of kind of having this um, hub and spoke model um, with, you know, the centralized localization um, team and localization sits uh, again, kind of more broadly in this like subgroup called global services, a huge part of which is localization and, and the kind of quality aspects that Michael mentioned, but we have a few other colleagues as well who are kind of doing cross cross cutting initiatives, like, um, you know, saying, how are we going to take our print product to market uh, in, in several key different growth markets and what do we have to do differently in different markets. So it's a bit of growth, it's a bit of localization and um, that's kind of what global services is. It's really helping all of our colleagues um, achieve their global like, growth goals and objectives um, through localization, program management, things like that. So, yeah. So you mentioned a big number before, like whatever, 100, uh, 100 plus language is, uh, you know, that that's the aim. So can you just give us a bit more of the, the, the size of things, locales, kind of platforms, how many localized releases, uh, just, just a, you know, seems like a obviously a very big operation already. Indeed. Yep. Uh, so we're currently <laughs> available in 104 locales. Uh, we scaled back from 132 a little while ago. Um, we're a web-based platform, so 
if you can run a browser on your device, you can use Canva on that device. Um, but besides the web app, we also have native apps on iOS, Android, uh, PC and Mac desktop, and most tablets. Uh, we also have different flavors for each of those platforms, specifically for China, for various reasons. Uh, and we release new production versions of Canva every weekday on every device and in every language. Um, which can, can I swear on this podcast? <laughs> will, it, will it bleep me well, out? <laughs> I can. Try it. Uh, Try okay. it. You can. You can. By all means. <laughs> it's fucking massive. Um, it's it's a huge <laughs> undertaking. <laughs> That'll be the uh, cutout yeah, quote, all, by the way. Yeah, the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it's a huge undertaking, and, and there are there are literally tens of thousands of variants when you combine all of those different um, possible uh, cross cutting um, features. Uh, so keeping all of that under some semblance of control is, is just an enormous task. And huge kudos to all of our project managers and engineers who, who managed to do that somehow. So this is yeah. Sorry, um, just some some. I oh, I do have some like, kind of actually fast numbers um, on hand. So as Michael mentioned, we're in 104 languages. Um, we are actually localizing over 40,000 words um, per month. So and that's exclusive of the um, volume that we localize with our template content as well, which would add hundreds of thousands. Um, right now in Canva, we have uh, about 450,000 non-English templates in our library, and we are helping to support over 20 localized marketing channels um, internally at Canva. So it's pretty fucking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're, you're right, the templates. And I, I didn't, I mean, I, I, I was going to ask this later on, but I mean, since you bring it up, like there's all this creative content that that is now i'm just using kind of the english but obviously if i didn't speak english i mean i wouldn't want to be working off a like an english template if i don't even speak english so yeah just so this is very very large and is this complex to localize i mean it's all kind of it's a design uh task as well to some in some sense right yeah, I mean, oh gosh, you know, just looking at that slice itself, templates, um, yes, it is, to answer your question, is it is complex. I think the teams uh, have done an amazing job really job really making um, that complexity into something that's a, a really approachable workflow. In a nutshell, what we do is we take a template, we're able to extract the XML um, for translation, we send that off to our localization vendor, it comes back, popped into a template and then uh, we have a tool that we built internally uh, which is called RT, which allows us to take a look at the English template the original template and the localized one side by side uh, and allows a reviewer a native language reviewer to go in uh, make um, line breaks any like you know text wrapping issues stuff like that it allows them to change um, or add to the localized metadata to make the template again more easily discoverable um, and just make sure that, you know, all said and done, once it's been localized, it's still relevant for that market. Um, so things like that, we've, we've, it's one of actually our kind of um, um, key company values is making complex things simple. And I think um, uh, localized templates have actually been a, a wonderful manifestation uh, of living that value for sure. How hard is it to, uh, especially uh, when you go into maybe Asia or maybe parts of Africa, but like I'm more familiar with Asia, like, I mean, Japanese kind of design language, for example, is very different. Korean one as well. Like, would you adjust, like, would you have templates that are only in Japanese or would you try to like graphically localize into Japanese? Is that Iggy, Michael? <laughs> Sorry, my dog in the background. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it's it's a blend of both, um, all of the above. So we have um, uh, our localized templates um, that we've taken from English and, and localized for all of these different languages. Uh, and there's another team in Chile at Canva, um, the international template team, who works on creating what we call these bespoke uh, market-specific templates as well. And their objective is to capture market design trends, um, market specific events, holidays, traditions, celebrations, yeah. um, and just all the kind of considerations that you might have on a, on a really hyper local level that you can't really get from just trying to localize something from English. Um, and their work is stunning. It's amazing. Uh, we work quite closely with them and they're just an absolutely brilliant you know, designers. Wow. Yeah, that, that is a challenge of a different magnitude. So be, because those challenges are so, I mean, 
they're so they're there's kind of they're bigger than most other organizations actually that that we would talk to like how do you weigh the build versus buy in terms of i mean you're building a lot of your technology mm-hmm. internally you just meant, mentioned rt right but then you also mentioned that you're sending some mm-hmm. of the the, the 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 localization translation work out to a vendor so how do you balance what do you build what do you buy like how, is that kind of an ongoing discussion or do you have a, a strategy there yeah um i think Speaking broadly, um, it, it, it's always evolving. Um, and I think that what we do is we generally start with, with buy. Um, we, things move really, really quickly, uh, at Canva and, um, the rate at which we try to, you know, which we do develop the product, um, kind of push ideas into, into development. Um, we don't always have the time afforded to, to build, um, but allowing us to kind of buy first helps us understand better what our needs are and, um, you know, what we're trying to achieve in a way. Um, so we generally start with outsourcing, um, you know, uh, we, the localization itself, um, the tooling, uh, and then we're, once we're kind of finding what's what's working, we're able to step back and say, right, how can we make this more efficient by um, either investing more? Sometimes it's it's not about, um, it's not about building, but, are, are, you know, can we create efficiencies, um, both cost efficiencies and workflow efficiencies by building? Uh, and what is the long-term objective of this, like, let's say, specific focus if we're looking at localized templates? You know, what is the long-term vision for localized templates? Is this something that we're going to need to be doing in perpetuity? If so, mm-hmm. then this is something we should consider looking to build, right, if we can. Um, so that is one thing. I mean, there's even taking um, um, the bespoke, market bespoke templates, um, we are taking a, a bit of a blend approach there too, where we have the international templates team uh, really establishing um, the kind of design voice that we have in these different markets and laying down that foundation of content. But also they are now working with some design agencies and specific markets too and, and art directing them um, to you know what, what we need. Um, but in order to reach the scale that we need and the time we need, we have yes turned to again, outsource um, some of that as well. So it really just depends, but I would say that um, going quickly um, is is one of our kind of core objectives. And and I think uh, buying allows us to do that. Got it. Okay. So, I mean, you mentioned a bit about the templates and how you work with them, but it sounds like, you know, you're localizing all sorts of different content. So I'm wondering... And I, I suspect that you do, but are you taking a different approach to your different types of content? Um, so you segmenting it, maybe sending it to different vendors or running a different workflow, you know, where does machine translation comes in? How, how do you think about the different types of content that you're working with? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think um, we're thinking about uh, who the end audience is um, and, and where this content is living. Um, so for example, uh, at, well, and also <laughs> the type of content we're looking at um, because of the volume that we're looking at for localized templates, for example, again, speaking to kind of the speed uh, at which we produce things too, uh, neuroadaptive machine translation has actually been um, you know, critical, I think, to our, our success and really being able to um, achieve a, a high quality, high volume localized template library in a short amount of time. Um, when we're looking at marketing content, for example, things that need to be much more white gloved, um, we are going kind of do, we have a model right now where we're still kind of working through where we have our, uh, our regular, you know, LSPs work on content and then the language managers that Michael mentioned before, they're coming in to kind of white glove um, some of that content and make sure that it's like really on point and that the brand tone of voice is adhered to. Uh, and especially as we start looking towards things like trans creation, they'll, they really are starting to play an even larger role um, in um, how things like, you know, growth experiments through hyper-localized or trans-created content uh, works. So, um, yeah, it's, it's usually kind of depending, you know, where this content is going to end up. Uh, we generally work with about five to seven kind of key LSPs who, who do take the majority of our, our translated content. And I think it's usually about what happens to that content afterwards, um, you know, whether or not it's being just put into the product or going to, to marketing, et cetera. So you, you got a big team and you're working with a number of vendors, so that's not going to be um, super cheap. So what's the kind of Canvas take on ROI 
for localization? Is it just because it's a kind of a new company? Well, it's a startup. It's a fast growing startup. Y- you want to go global very quickly. Is it just part of the whole journey or is there already kind of a, a sophisticated ROI uh, monitoring metric behind this all? Um, yeah, that's always uh, that's always the question, right? In the localization industry is proving ROI and kind of yes. justifying this investment. Um, I, well, we have been in, incredibly lucky, I think, with Canva in that, um, as I was kind of chatting about before, it was always the company ethos to to get the product into as many languages as, as possible, pretty much. And um, something I'm a bit fond of saying is you have a business case um, for, you know, 50 if maybe locales a really strong business case mm. um for maybe 50 if locales right um we can kind of take things to the coo and say look here's what investment looks like um but for the long tail languages not so much right and um because it was always this ethos of empowering the world to design through localization um through accessibility um it was really you know again part of our values and so you know the ro it was localization hasn't always been strictly tied to roi um in the same way it would be in many other companies as well um i think again when we're looking at the type of content that's being localized at any one time we need to we we definitely make a point of saying um you know are we doing this as efficiently as possible um are there other cost uh, efficient ways we could be approaching this um but again, yeah, I think because we've had leadership buy-in from from the get-go, we've been pretty lucky. Um, it's a return on investment on putting our money where our mouth is. When we're saying empowering the world to design, we mean the world, at almost whatever. Cost just just a quick really. follow-up on that for for China. I mean, I lived in China. It's always hard to roll out uh, SaaS in China generally. Like, are, are you in mm. China? And is it is it do you have a lot of users there? Yeah, we are in China. Um, China is where we set up our first, um, I believe our first engineering team that's outside of Sydney um, because of the product divergence that Michael referred to as well. You know, um, we had to hyper localize that product, which means we had to build it on a different stack. Um, it also had to be behind the great firewall um, to be working properly. And so to set up that kind of team, um, you need the operations to support it. So, um, yeah, China continues to be a huge focus for us. Well, I mean, you mentioned that you're obviously fast growing and, and fast paced, fast moving. But I'm wondering how, you know, you at Canva and what both of your experiences were in terms of adapting to any changes brought about by the pandemic. I mean, we, we at least most of the world have been sort of on global uh, lockdowns or we've been working remotely for about a year now. So as a as a response to that, have you seen a any sort of changes in demand for SaaS design? Um, mm-hmm. And how have you as localization as a localization team uh, adapted and responded to any challenges that, that have been associated with that? Yeah, I mean, most definitely, uh, we we as Canva have have seen um, a huge increase in the kinds of users who are using Canva to um, that make their own marketing material. I think that there's been a huge uptake or increase rather um, in with cottage industries um, and folks who may have unfortunately lost their jobs due to the pandemic, um, or who are looking, you know, to set up like a side hustle or side gig to support themselves and um, may not have access or, or, or you know may not be able to afford um, kind of professional design services, brand marketing services, stuff like that. And so these kind of DIYers, um, the solo entrepreneurs as well um, as a result of the pandemic for sure, um, which has been really interesting. I think that um, for better or for worse, COVID has really changed the face of um, what small to medium business businesses look like. Um, and yeah, we've, we've definitely seen that cascade into our user demographics um in terms of in terms of our workforce and, and localization i mean i think um and and being a remote remote team I, I think of all the teams in canva we are probably affected the least because this is how we've always worked yeah. um our teams are always distributed you know whether it's the vendors that we're working with our own team members um we're used to it so we take and we live in australia so we take calls at very strange hours um and uh yeah, we've we've adapted quite well, Michael. I don't know um, if you have your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I'm just recalling the the immediate aftermath of of when 
the, the pandemic really became mm. a global issue. And uh, it was kind of all hands on deck for a period. And um, we were trying to do yeah. everything we could as a company to, to, to limit the impact for our users and also to, to help where we could. So, you know, there was a, an, uh, I don't know if this is the right word, but an amnesty on, on subscriptions. Anyone who couldn't pay because of COVID were, 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 was able to continue with their subscription because it was vital to people's work. Um, and we also produced a, a huge amount of, of content uh, for education around uh, uh, hygiene and, and, and avoiding um, contracting COVID uh, that was localized into a number of languages. So that was a really, this, there was a period there when it wasn't business as usual uh, and there was a lot of different things going on. But then very quickly, um, as, as Rach said, we were, we moved back into a business as usual because I think a lot of our supply chains were, again, for lack of a better phrase, were unaffected. There were remote workers who had always worked that way. Yeah. And, and what about on a regional level? I mean, if you're thinking about demand increasing um, globally, potentially, and then also you guys expanding the languages as well. I mean, are there any locales that are tricky especially tricky um to go in or to go into um that you know that you would see as sort of problematic or challenging for that reason yeah there, there are definitely challenging languages uh and, and markets uh, more generally um for different reasons i mean uh, the, the one that springs to mind is our, our arabic and hebrew speaking markets um they're right to left languages they're they're sort of intrinsically difficult in terms of uh, product UI and also in terms of design, which is uh, which is very critical to our business. Um, uh, yeah, RTL always makes life that little bit harder. Um, but also culturally, I mean, making sure we have a huge amount of content that is uh, that is quite region specific, and making sure that you're culturally appropriate in regions without a uh, Christian or Christian colonial history is is difficult because that's the the perspective. From which a lot of our content is produced um, and different cultural and religious attitudes towards things like alcohol and um, consumption of animals different animals and and um, modesty you know clothing modesty that there are just different attitudes out there and, and you you have to strike a, a balance between uh, potentially alienating part of your audience which is something that we would never want to do uh, and on the other hand depriving part of our audience of content that they would find really useful um, and, and of course, the, on the other perspective, you could uh, perpetually be curating the experience for every subset of users, but that, that's also not particularly scalable. So it, it really is a, it's a challenge that we're, we're trying to get better at. And I think we're doing a good job, but it, there's more work to be done. Let's stick with the challenge of Australia and living in Australia, which must be so hard. No, uh, sorry, just a quick <laughs> joke there. But uh, is there is there any specific <laughs> challenge of running a localization team as big as yours out of Australia in terms of like liaising with global vendors or hiring uh, localization talent? I mean, I, yeah, I, I remember once we posted an ad on Lockjobs where the actually that the offer was you could you would support the relocation to Australia. I'm sure that got a fair amount of uh, of applications, but is it a challenge or not at all? I would say um, it, it is a challenge. Um, again, you know, with localization, I, uh, a lot of the industry does follow the um, chasing the sun model, um, and so as such, a lot of the LSPs have project management hubs. Uh, in, in different places around the world, including some that are in Asia and have a much better, um, much friendlier time zone um, for us. But we have definitely found it uh, difficult um, to to hire the right people, for example, on our team, you know, for our team in Sydney, um, you know, working um, through um, a lot of different challenges in that space. Um, and also, you know, getting to connect to some of our localization and globalization industry peers as well. Um, it's wonderful because there's so many different organizations and, and groups set up now and places like LinkedIn or, or, you know, podcasts like this that we kind of get to, um, to be a part of. Um, but, you know, to kind of be able to go out and, and grab a beer and kind of, you know, chat shop, um, not as accessible here, I would say. Um, but overall, because here in, in Sydney, we're actually on the east coast of Australia, um, and then 
as close as you can get before you there to the west coast of the states where you know and, and san francisco where a lot of that tech space is um it's not terrible the the time difference you get used to it after a while um yeah it's 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 gone pretty well though i think um the world's gotten a lot smaller over the last few years i'd say did it did uh, um, also so add, what's add, sorry sorry for just add to that that we we have a wonderful pool of talent here in sydney so for instance we were recently hiring on our team and completely location mm. blind the best candidate that we recently hired will be joining us in a couple of weeks we're very excited was based here in sydney so uh, you know, the, there are there are wonderful people here in Sydney working in localization and working in LSP. So mm. it, it's it's not the complete desert island that you might imagine. Um, no. From, from the <laughs> other. <laughs> are, are the offices open yeah. now, or are you? So if you if you want, you can go back to the office and work from the office. Or Rach yeah. is currently working yeah, I from the office. About, yeah, I come in about two or three days a week. I live. Um, Again, I live out by the beaches, pour one out for me. Um, so <laughs> sometimes I decide to work from home, but we do have that flexibility. Things are pretty um, pretty open here. So I think people have just really adjusted into um, whatever suits them for their, their personal life. You know, if it's easier for them to stay at home um, than they do, but it's, it's pretty open. Excellent. So what about initiatives, key things you're planning over the next 12, 18 months roadmap uh, in the localization team? Yeah, um, I mean, the um, the wonderful challenge that we always have with localization is at Canva is because Canva is growing so quickly, um, we have a chance to localize that much more, right? So uh, as with every kind of you know platform or focus uh, that we're looking at internally, it's another opportunity for us to take on a challenge. So um, uh, things like uh, our education platform is one um, that's really exciting that we're looking to uh, localize even more deeply uh, in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, a huge part of what we're doing is also doubling down on what we're calling kind of the fundamentals of, of our localized product um, that are really kind of around the three key pillars. So uh, our content, all that template content I mentioned before, again, fonts, bespoke elements, things like that. Um, the overall UX, so the translation quality itself, um, making sure that um, search and discoverability are really working and making sure that Canva feels like it was developed natively. Um, and then lastly, um, what I kind of think of as, as payment ease, so making sure that we're integrated with the right you know, local payment platforms where applicable, um, that we have um, uh, local payment methods um, where applicable as well. Uh, to make that experience much easier for our users. So there's there's still a lot of work for us to do there. And then as we look to new markets for, for growth going into 2022, starting that process over again for those markets as well. Got it. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I'm, I'm yeah. cognizant. Uh, well, Michael, anything to add? Uh, yeah, there are, there, there are a few other things on the uh, sort of more internal side. We have, we have a long roadmap of localization engineering work to be done. Um, as I mentioned, we're hiring for that team. Yeah. So come and join us if you want to <laughs> yeah. get involved. We're, we're working on everything from improving translator context to building an experimentation framework for microcopy. Um, so that's a major initiative is, is really building out that team and making sure we have the talent to make all of that happen. Um, very quickly, other things, user education, making sure that we uh, improve the way we educate users about our product. We've been lucky enough to have an amazing international community of designers who teach others to to use Canva, but that's something that we can improve on. And also, I think doing more for for good. It's one. Of, it's another one of our uh, mm. company values is to to uh, be a good human and be a force for good. Uh, and we've been lucky enough to have a, a lot of freedom to pursue projects for purely altruistic causes, and and that's something we'd like to double down on double down on over the next uh, year or so. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we've, we've supported other teams' projects to produce COVID education materials and uh, participated in uh, the unfortunately very ne necessary Stop Asian Hate campaign, amongst others. But we'd like to initiate some of those projects internally and make sure that we're really uh, delivering that to our global community. Great. Well, that sounds like a, a pretty full plate. So uh, cognizant of time <laughs> and uh, the evening fast approaching over in, in Sydney, I uh, would like to really thank you both for taking the time to speak to us. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the, our audience finds this super valuable. So thanks so much, uh, Rachel and Michael. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much thank for having you us. Guys. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye.